It's difficult to define glory, but you know it once you've experienced it. This time of year, I think that one of the primary ways that we get a tangible experience of glory is through the beauty of nature. When I was growing up, my summer times were often spent going camping at uh, Texas state parks. We went hiking through the woods. We went canoeing in rivers. I, I can just close my eyes right now and remember uh, all these different things. I can hear the crunch of the pine needles under my feet. I can hear the, the sound of the paddles moving through the water or those sunset songs of cicadas in the summertime. And then once it was dark, I can remember looking up and seeing the glimmer of stars in the night sky. And each one of those steps in the woods, each stroke in the river, each glimmer of stars was a whisper of glory. And then, of course, I, I moved up to the Pacific Northwest, and the beauty of nature just went to a whole new level. Clear summertime skies show off the outline of the Olympic Mountains across Puget Sound as the waters sparkle. There's the Mount Rainier that, that we can see snow-topped and towering to our south. And then there are countless trees and lakes everywhere you look. And then, of course, the night sky has actually been putting on quite a show over the last few months. If you've been paying attention, in May, there was a meteor shower, there was a super moon, and there were a number of especially bright planets that you could see in the sky. Uh, in this month, uh, going on right now, actually, there's the Neowise Comet flying through the night sky. Uh, it should be visible over the next week or two. Uh, but it won't be back after that for, they estimate, another uh, 7,000 years or so. So if you're interested, you should go get a look at it while you can because you'll have to wait 7,000 years uh, to see it again. Uh, but, but again, whether it's, it's your blooming gardens in your backyard or towering mountains across the sound or shooting stars in the sky, each one of these is a whisper of glory. It's difficult to define glory, but you know it when you've experienced it. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's that tickle down your spine or that balloon expanding in your chest. It is the wonder and curiosity that leaves you simultaneously trying to tell someone about what it is you've just experienced, but also completely wordless to say anything about it. This is the wonder of glory. And the psalmist knows it well. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is where we're going today as we continue our journey through the Psalms this summer. Psalm 8. Now, you know, this week is actually the 51st anniversary of the Apollo 11 lunar landing. And in addition to sending the first person to the moon, that mission also sent this small disk of statements and messages from leaders across the world. And among those leaders was the Catholic Pope at the time, 1969, Paul VI. And the message that he sent was Psalm 8. He just sent Psalm 8 you know, wrote his name down as the sender of, of the message. And, and I love that. I love that right now there is a disc on the moon with Psalm 8 on it. And, and that is very appropriate because among other things, this psalm reflects on the heavens, the stars, and the moon, and the glory of God in all of it. So let's read it together. Psalm chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? 
What are human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God, we thank you for the beauty of creation and for your glory reflected within it. God, I pray as we reflect on the words of the scripture that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this psalm opens up and closes the very same way with praise to God, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now we've talked about this idea of a name before. Right? In, in that culture, a name is not just what you call someone, but it reflects that person's character, their very being. And so in, in Numbers chapter 6, God blesses his people, and it says he puts his name on them. He gives them his character. In the Song of Songs, chapter 1, one lover says to another, your name is like perfume. You are sweet to me. Or in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2, we read, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. And, and we learn to pray in the name of Jesus also. And this is not just uh, a reference to a name. This is a reference to, to the character and the being. And so here in this uh, Psalm chapter 8, the beginning and the end, we see that God's name is majestic. This isn't just complimenting God on his cool name. It's a proclamation that his character, his very being, is majestic over all the earth. This is a declaration that no matter where you go, you are bound to catch glimpses and hear whispers of God's glory. And then the rest of the psalm is essentially a survey of God's glorious creation. It goes from top to bottom. And the rest of verse one, it says, you have set your glory in the heavens. And then in verse three, the psalmist considers the moon and the stars. And then all the way down in verse eight, he makes his way from the birds in the sky to all that swim in the paths of the seas and the depths below. So from the highest heavens above the moon and the stars down to the deepest depths, God's majesty and glory is great in all the earth. And in many ways, we can hear echoes of the creation story throughout this psalm. After all, Genesis 1 begins with the creation of heavens and earth. And in this psalm, it begins with God's name and all the earth and his glory in the heavens. Genesis 1 tells of God creating the moon and the stars, flocks and herds, birds and fish. This psalm tracks all of those things. It is a celebration of the work that God has done in creation. God is majestic, God is powerful, and God is glorious. And we see this in creation itself. But in the midst of contemplating all of this glory, a question emerges in verse 4. The psalmist asks, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You see, the psalmist is having one of those moments where he is hearing the whispers of glory. And when you're at the foot of Mount Rainier or standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, or when you look up at the vast expanse of the stars, you cannot help but feel so small in the midst of it. And perhaps wonder yourself, 
what is mankind? That God would be mindful of them. What are human beings that God would care for them? And yet, we really only have to finish reading the creation story to know the answer to that question. Because after God fills the heavens with the sun and moon and stars, after he fills the earth with plants and animals, after he fills the sky with birds and the sea with fish, what does God do? What does he do after that? Well, he makes human beings. He creates humanity, but he does not just make humanity alongside the rest of creation. In Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is what God does as he makes humanity in his image, that they may rule. Now look at how our psalm says this. It says it in verses 5 and 6, a response to the question in verse 4. It says, you have made them, humans, a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. And you put everything under their feet. So, so get this, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens, right? God is majestic. God is glorious. And what does he do with this glory? He gives it away. He creates humanity, and then what does it say? He crowns them with glory. So this is who God is. God is powerful and glorious, but rather than storing up all of that glory for himself, he uses his power and his glory to empower humanity and crown them, crown us with glory. And so this leads us back to the question, who are we as humans? What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Who are we? Well, we are carriers of God's glory. We are carriers of God's glory. We are crowned with glory and honor. Now, here's something that I want you to sit with for a little while, okay? We often look around at nature and we marvel at the glory of God. We sense God's glory in sunsets and mountains. We sense God's glory in the forests and the fresh air. But how often do we sense God's glory in one another? How often do we sense God's glory in ourselves? Now, every now and then, we, we might feel inspired by some great historical figure, or, or maybe we'll be in awe of someone that we look up to. But a lot of the time, rather than awe for one another, we feel annoyed with one another, right? Or, or when you think of your own self, uh, if you were to try to come up with a few words about how you feel about yourself, you're much more likely to come up with the word guilty than the word glory. And yet, what is the first thing that Scripture says about us? In this psalm, God has crowned us with glory and honor. If we take the creation story seriously the way that this psalm does, then we would look at one another and see the image of God, fellow human beings crowned with glory and honor. C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, reflecting on this very truth, that when we remember, uh, or that we ought to remember, that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may very one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, 
you would be strongly tempted to worship it. The dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day become a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship it, right? If you could truly see the beloved and glorious identity of your fellow humans, you would be strongly tempted to worship them. This is who we are, glory-crowned image bearers of God. This is who you are. This is who your neighbor is. Every person that you see or come into contact with, glory crowned, image bearer of God himself. And I want to be clear about something. This glory is not given as some kind of reward or some kind of status. This glory is not some kind of club that you get into. God does not crown people with glory because they are old and wise or because they are rich and powerful or because they are strong and mighty. Verse 2 of this psalm says that it is through the praise of children and infants that God establishes his stronghold. Children and infants These are those who cannot even walk or talk. God's kingdom is not built by the strong and the powerful, but rather by the helpless and the weak. The least of these are the ones who bear God's glory. And so no matter who you are, you are a carrier of, of God's glory. No matter who your neighbor is, they are an image bearer of the divine. Every human you see or meet, the glory of God dwells within them. They are the image bearing human of God. And so as we are humans who carry the glory of God, what do we do? with this glory? What are we supposed to do with this glory? Well, it's clear in Genesis chapter 1 and in this psalm, uh, in verse 6, it says, you made them humans rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. So you see, just as God is mindful of and cares for humans, so humanity is meant to be mindful of and care for creation on God's behalf. Just as God gives his glory away to humanity, so humanity is called to use their glory for the good of creation. This is what we are meant to do. But but what have we actually done with the glory that God has given to us? Well, in Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve show that rather than caring for creation— They used creation for their own advantage when they ate the fruit of the tree. And then in Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel shows that rather than honoring the image of God in one another, Cain grew jealous and oppressed his brother and murdered him. And on and on it goes. God, in his glory, has generously given it away. But humans and our glory, have selfishly stored it up. And this is the problem of sin. This is the problem of sin. What God meant for good, we have used for evil. What God meant for good, we have used for evil. What God meant to empower, we have used to oppress. What God meant for generosity, we have used selfishly. But thanks be to God that when we are selfish, God remains generous. When we are evil, God remains good. And so if the problem of sin is what God meant for good, we have used for evil, then the answer of the gospel is what we have meant for evil, God has used for good. What we have meant for evil, God has used for good. This is the answer of the gospel. This is what God has done. 
when we failed to live in the glory that God had given to us, God took on flesh and dwelt among us so that we could see his glory. And when he lived among us, he used his glory to care for the sick, the poor, and the hurting. He used his glory to call and empower his disciples. When God came in flesh to dwell among us, he generously gave his glory away. And yet, while he dwelt here on the earth, the problem of sin persisted. The Jewish and Roman officials felt threatened by him. They were used to their power and their influence. They were used to storing up glory for themselves. And so they conspired together to arrest Jesus and have him crucified. They used their power to oppress. And they thought that they had dealt with this little disruption to their glory. But once again, what was meant for evil, God used for good. And three days after that evil crucifixion, Jesus rose again, and his glory was put on full display. And I want you to look, look at how the New Testament describes the resurrection. All right, uh, among many places in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22, it says that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And God placed all things under his feet. God placed all things under his feet. Does that sound familiar? Look back at verse 6 of the psalm. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. You see, we failed to live in the glory that God had given to us. But where we failed, Christ succeeded. Where sin brought death, Christ succeeded brought life. And in Ephesians 1 or 1 Corinthians 15 or Hebrews chapter 2, all of these New Testament passages quote from this psalm to describe the death, resurrection, rule, and reign of Jesus. In each of those places, it says that he has put everything under his feet as he rules and reigns in the light and glory of his resurrection. And after Jesus is resurrected in glory, what does he do then? What does he do next? Surely he, he realizes that it truly was a mistake to give glory to humanity in the first place, right? So he holds on to it for himself. Listen to his own words. After his resurrection, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Therefore, go. Make disciples. All authority has been given to Jesus. All things are under his feet. And yet, he calls his disciples to him. He empowers them and he sends them out. What does Jesus do with the glory of his resurrection? He gives it away. To all who follow him, he crowns them with glory that they might once more fulfill that call to care for creation and to establish his kingdom. This is the story of Psalm 8. It's the story of the gospel. And so what do I want you to take from all of this? Well, as we close up, let me reiterate three things for you. One, God is majestic in all the earth. 
God is majestic in all the earth. This psalm is a psalm of God's power and glory in creation. God reigns and rules over all things. So let us cast down all idols, all other allegiances, and worship him alone with all of our lives. God is majestic in all the earth. Number two, humanity is crowned with glory and honor. Humanity is crowned with glory and honor. In all of God's power and glory, he chose to give it to humans who bear his image. You are glorious. Not because of anything that you have done, but just like children and infants, because you are created in God's image. The more we receive this truth for ourselves, the more we should acknowledge this truth for others as well. As we live in relationship with our friends and families, neighbors and even enemies, we must always treat them with honor as fellow image bearers of God. Humanity is crowned with glory and honor. We must live that way together. Number three, as followers of Jesus, we are called to use the glory given to us for the kingdom of God. As followers of Jesus, we are called to use the glory given to us for the kingdom of God. Right? Though we have failed miserably to live in God's glory. In Christ, the, that glory has been restored to us. And just as God set humanity over creation in the beginning, in Christ, he now sends us to establish his kingdom. A practical way to think about this is this. What has been set under your feet? What has been set under your feet? What things in the world and life are you able to influence for the kingdom of God? You know, maybe it's your children. As you feed them and play with them, as you love them and care for them, you are establishing the kingdom of God. Maybe it's your job, right? And as you do your work, with excellence, and love your co-workers with kindness. You are establishing the kingdom of God. Maybe it's some kind of group or organization that you're involved in as you participate in meetings, as you develop relationships with others. You are establishing the kingdom of God. Or maybe a far stretch. Maybe it's this church, right? As you worship and serve with this community, as we together learn and grow in God, as we cross the street and partner together in peace, that is when we discover and establish the kingdom of God. As followers of Jesus, we are called to use this glory given to us for the kingdom of God. And every day, as we see his kingdom come, our voices can be raised up with the psalmist to say, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.